So thanks everyone for coming. So I'm just going to introduce Ruth here. Um, so I've personally been connected with AJWS, the American Jewish World Service. Uh, for a number of years, I did a volunteer trip in El Salvador with them many years ago, kind of helping uh, post-earthquake relief reconstruction. That's one of the many, many projects that AJWS um, organizes. And so I was thrilled when I was contacted by AJWS telling me that Ruth wanted to come and speak with us about uh, many of the more recent projects they've been involved with. So today we'll be mostly talking about their work in India, as you um, all seen in the invite. So, yeah, I'll just give it to Ruth to edit. Thank you, <laughs> to Anya. I am delighted both for all of you here in the room and for all of you that are on remote. It's really wonderful opportunity for me to be able to talk with a lot of you. I'm Ruth Messenger. I um, have the privilege of running American Jewish World Service, and I'm based in New York, but Laura Talmas is the executive director in the San Francisco office, and Sprinza Katz is on the staff in the San Francisco office, so we are here um, as well. We're gonna just, you can you feel free to look at the slides at any point that you might want. I'm not talking to them specifically, but it's just a loop of photographs that show both some of our work around the world on site in various communities, and the grassroots activists that we support. And also, I think there's some pictures of the advocacy that we do in this country, targeted to members of Congress to get them to change um, policies. I want to give you an introduction to American Jewish World Service generally, and then talk, as Anya promised, about our work in India. Let me just start with one Indian story, and we'll come back to that at the end. This is about a woman named Zinat. Zinat was, when she was 17 years old, had already been divorced three times, all from marriages that were made against her will. Um, she was first married right after puberty, which I'm sorry to tell you is sometimes late, um, to a man who abused her, and then she was abused in her two subsequent marriages. She'd never been to a doctor, and she didn't know, and this is really quite common for us around the world, that actually she lives in a country, in this case India, in which there's a good law. So there's a law in India, the Protection of Women from Domestic Violence, it um, passed, was passed in 2005, and that law should have protected her from the abuse, but obviously if she doesn't know about it, um, the cultural practices don't change that quickly. So what happened was that Dinat came to the office of one of our grantee organizations, it's called the Shaheen Resource Center for Women, and it works on in uh, uh, Hyderabad in the old city and it's targeted specifically to help Muslim women so this is a large Muslim population in a Hindu country and Dalit women Dalit is the current name for the caste lowest caste which used to be called the untouchable some of you obviously know this um, uh, so Shaheen works with Muslim and women uh, Muslim and Dalit women and girls against gender discrimination and gender-based violence they helped her negotiate an agreement with her parents that recognized her legal right to be protected from both domestic violence and forced marriage. They referred her to a doctor who checked for pregnancy and sexually transmitted diseases. And most importantly, of course, they provided her with vocational training that allowed her to become financially independent, less likely to fall victim to the same situation again. And now she's in a position, which is where Shaheen is trying to get many women, that um, she both has some economic independence and if at any point she chooses or wants to marry again, she has the support of her family. She knows she has the ability to leave an abusive marriage if she chooses. She knows what her rights are and she knows how to access services. So that's like a capsule story of what we're doing around the world. We are an American-based um, non-governmental organization that um, describes ourselves as being inspired by the Jewish commitment to pursue justice, but working to realize human rights and to end poverty for the most marginalized people in the developing world. We support a large number, 550 small, usually grassroots, social justice organizations in Africa, Asia, and the Americas, targeted to 19 countries, um, they particularly affect the lives of women and girls, migrants and refugees, um, and the LGBTI population. And in the thematic areas in which they work are um, to promote recovery from conflict and disasters, 
to defend access to food, land, and livelihoods, so agricultural sustainability, and to advance the rights of women and girls, which is what we were talking about. Well, the way we think about our work is that we are supporting rights that people, by and large, in this country take for granted. The right to education, the right to health care, the right to f the be free to speak our minds, the right to vote in elections, the right to love whom we choose, and frankly, the right to live, we hope, without violence and rape and discrimination. And then very importantly, from the livelihood's point of view, the right for people to till their own land. Um, those rights are as I said before, not recognized in many of these countries, or sadly, they're recognized in print, but they're not recognized in reality. And what we do, and what we are really good at, is finding these grassroots partners. So I want to sort of take a moment and, and <coughs> clarify for you, because many of you know very, very good international relief and development organizations. We do do some relief work, and I'll talk about that briefly. But we are distinguished from almost any other Western or American organization that you might know of that works in the developing world because we don't send Western staff. So we can find a group, we can sometimes find a group that starts with a grant literally of two or three thousand dollars. Our average gift over many, many years is around thirty thousand dollars a year. And that is an amount of money invested in local people who have their own vision of justice and are doing their own work. That's an amount of money to change the lives of a community um, in a many very, very dramatic ways. And sometimes our organizations grow to a point where they're highly visible. They're known in the public world. We were the first funder of Lema Bowie, the Liberian woman who won the Nobel Peace Prize two years ago for the works that she did um, to bring peace to Liberia. But to be honest with you, most of our organizations are not going to win the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, but they are advancing and changing the status for people who live in some of the most difficult parts of the world. So I do want to talk about India, but I want to just say two other things about our work in general. We take monitoring and evaluation of our work very seriously. So we hold our project partners, our very grassroots partners, accountable for the work they do. And we stay with them for a long time. And while that is the core of our work, is the grant making work we do overseas, we also work in this country. And in this country, we meet with groups like you. We work with people who will help us on some key advocacy issues. Because there are areas in which if the United States would change its policy and practice, things would be vastly different, not just for the 550 groups that we work with, but for people all over the world. And the most current example of that is actually in the President's budget. So in the budget that the White House announced two days ago is a provision to move food aid money out of the Department of Agriculture, where by law, by law, it has to be used to buy American food and ship it tens of thousands of miles away, which takes longer, costs much more, and undermines local farmers. And so in the budget, 45% of the food aid money going forward, if Congress passes the budget, um, would be um, able to be used flexibly for local procurement of food, which is a huge change in, it's an efficient use, better, more efficient use of our tax dollars, but it's also a huge investment in agricultural sustainability around the world. So some of you know about us from our disaster work. We did substantial work against the genocide in Darfur, and we continue to work on peace issues in Sudan. Many people, we came to many people's attention after the 2004 tsunami um, in South Asia, um, and more recently after the earthquake in Haiti. And I'm happy to go back and talk about any of that work later when you get a chance to ask questions, but I want to concentrate on our work in <coughs> India. So in some ways right now, of course, India is in the spotlight because of the horrific rape um, in um, Delhi and the story about the woman who was raped and died. Um, but I suspect, given who you are and given the wonderful place that we're meeting, that a lot of you sort of think about India in the terms in which the United States and the United States economic pages talk about India these days, which is as a hugely populous country with rapid development um, and a great deal of, um, of, of money being made and invested in country and a great deal of new technology and new capacity. 
And the problem is that, of course, all of that is true. But it's also a country with an ever-widening gap between its rich and its poor. So at the same time as you read, and you might have seen some of these stories about people who are building buildings that even in America would be considered like a condominium construct for 10 families with 10 huge floor-through apartments. It's owned by one person. He hasn't decided yet whether or not to move in, but he has, I think it's a 10, maybe it's a 12-story building you know, for himself and his family. So there are those excesses, but meanwhile, um, there, are, there are sort of two huge problems in this country that we've chosen to devote our attention to. One is that some of the efforts to make money both to develop new areas of cities and, more importantly, to develop new opportunities for mining um, are displacing people from their land. So I've actually been in a, in a rural, not rural, a semi-urban community in Delhi, which is the home where, where uh, uh, tens of thousands of people who used to live in a slum in Delhi were simply told you're being relocated. And not only are they losing their homes and therefore losing a sense of community, but these were all people who had some sort of job that they could make their way to. And they've now been displaced to a place on the outskirts of the city where the only job for them is garbage pickers. So they go out on the road and they collect garbage and they bring the garbage into this rural development area and they sort through it looking for valuables. And when I was there two years ago, they were at risk of losing that one single economic opportunity because um, it was becoming commercialized. So there were now new trucks that were going to be picking up garbage and uh, whatever you do with garbage, chewing it all up, but not allowing people to sort through it. And that might sound like, to all of us, like a great technological advance, except it meant that this whole community of thousands of people that were displaced from their homes in the city will now have nothing to sustain themselves and no way to get to any job that might be available. So the displacement of the poorest, both urban and rural people, from their land and homes due to development, industry, and mining is one big problem. And then the second problem, which we've, I've referenced already, is the pervasive discrimination and violence that's perpetrated against women and girls, <laughs> against the LGBTI population, and against the sex worker population. And you will remind me later, I want to say, be sure I say something about sex workers particularly. But um, so here's an example of um, the kind of work that we do in, in Mumbai specifically, where there is, as I said, throughout the country, there's a, a Muslim population. Life is particularly difficult for Muslim women. They are, um, traditional gender roles don't allow them to go to school. It deprives them of uh, status in their households. Um, they are forced into early marriage. Um, many of them, many of them in their teens, and some of them younger than that. You might have seen, this wasn't India, it was Afghanistan, but there was a story in the New York Times two weeks ago about a father who sold his six-year-old daughter um, into marriage in, or, as the only way to get some money for the family that was like in desperate straits. Um, uh, the economic, international um, statistics show that adolescent brides are much more likely to be abused. They're isolated from their communities. And as I said before, they don't have any idea that there's a law that would protect them. So there's a group we support in Mumbai. It's called Awazi Niswan. It's a group that um, works in the Muslim community to educate girls um, and to teach them what their rights are under the law, to teach them how to defend those rights. Um, to teach them the dangers of early marriage and early childbearing from a health point of view and from the point of view of interrupting their education and their economic growth potential. Um, girls are taught everything from self-defense self skills to um, uh, ways to become peer educators. They're taught how to um, express their rights against arranged ma marriages. And they're given some skills for financial independence. Um, and they're given vocational training, access to college scholarships, and assistance in finding jobs. And I think one of the strengths of this group and one of the reasons why I thought to include them in this presentation is they represent what American Jewish World Service is all about. They see the problem. They figured out the solution. And they saw that the solution couldn't just be unidimensional. It's not just stay in school. 
It's not just um, tell people what the law is and try to get them legal defenders. It's like you have to work on this issue on a variety of different levels at once. And from our point of view, ideally, we'll do that with groups, but we'll also hope that some of the groups that we're supporting will be preferencing education, peer education, and empowerment. Some of them will be emphasizing teaching young, young women some degree of financial literacy and financial independence, since that turns out to be one of the things they need in order to be able to stand their ground. Um, and it for sure involves teaching basic leadership skills. So working on all of these different fronts, we see that the, the alumni, the graduates of Oasi Niswan are really key leaders now in their community and they are joining in the effort that you may have read about in India recently of women standing up and saying, we have to end the, this essentially right to rape, which is so prevalent um, in our society. So in December, the staff and the alumni of Oasi Niswan was significantly involved in organizing around the country um, against rape and for violence-free environment for women. And make no mistake about it, this change will occur very slowly. But we're able with each of these groups that we fund to help them evaluate what they're doing and then to help them work with each other to evaluate any success in moving the needle on the broad questions of human rights and governance um, in country. And about India specifically, I would say it's sort of for me a mix. The good news is that it's a comparatively, comparatively given where we work, stable democracy that does have laws on the books. And the challenge right now is that not only people don't know those laws, but that people in this country think that India has solved all its problems. Um, and that's to our people who visit, stay in five-star hotels. Um, they think that there seem to be a lot of poor people in the streets, but that's not really the story. A lot of people know that that's where their call center is um, and that everything must be fine. So. It's a country that's, in a sense, at risk of being redefined as a developed world country when that is just not um, uh, its story. Okay, I wanted to just say a little bit about sex work because I'd like to see if I could possibly be controversial before we turn to questions. Um, so um, we work with a, organization, a couple of organizations in India and other organizations around the world, and we differ from many people you know in that we make a distinction between trafficking and sex work. And that distinction is not common, and sometimes it's commonly understood that there's a difference, but people see them the same. So I just wanna say that we work against trafficking. We work against child soldiers in Uganda and Ghana. We work against child slaves in the fishing industry in Ghana. We work against trafficked women all over. But there are women in this world, including in India, who have chosen sex work as the best way for them to make a living and support their families. They are, not, they are not owned by pimps. They are not the trafficked women who are moved across borders. They have decided that that is the way to, um, per, to create an income for themselves. It's not the choice that you would make or you would make or I would make, but we do believe in serious empowerment by people of their own futures. Um, and these women organize and get funding from us to protect their own health to stop themselves from being abused by the local police um, and um, to be sure that nobody comes in, as it were, to sort of buy them up. But they have chosen to do sex work as a profession and we are part of a small network of funding organizations around the world called the Red Umbrella Fund, which supports women who are sex workers by choice and not trafficked women. So one of the groups we support in India is an organization called um, Sangram, which works specifically for, uh, on behalf of sex workers in India in order to basically, as I said, uh, insist that their clients use condoms, um, provide access to health care, and, and get protection from the police if they are raped as opposed to actually selling their services to somebody. Um, so that's a very quick snapshot of work we do in India, which is actually paralleled by work we do all over the world. Um, India is the country with our, for us with our largest number of grantees. Of course, that's partly because of its size, but it also means that it offers us a significant opportunity for these groups to be working with each other, for these groups to be collaborating and learning those organizing, mobilizing advocacy techniques that will help them make change countrywide, which is our vision with, with them. It's their vision, and therefore it's our vision for their future. So that's the story.
um, starting with Zenat and ending with two or three organizations that I hope give you a flavor of what we do. But I would love to take your questions and challenges about anything. Yeah. <coughs> Googlers like to think of themselves as being data driven and a, a lot of people give their money to organizations uh, recommended by GiveWell, for example. I was interested, you're mentioning holding grantees accountable, doing evaluations. Uh, could you please say more about that? Sure. Um, first of all, we have um, very high ratings, highest ratings from the American Institute of Philanthropy, Charity Navigator, and the Better Business Bureaus, and we pride ourselves on that. Second of all, we have, we've grown a lot in the last, we're 28 years old, most of our growth has been in the last 14 years, and I say that to say we've gone from being a $2.8 million organization to a $51 million organization, and in the process, we have been thinking and rethinking our approach to monitoring and evaluation. So we've always done monitoring and evaluation for an individual grantee, and we basically have done it, and quite successfully, I want to say, by asking a, a grassroots organization that we were thinking of funding for them to tell us what would they do with fill in the blank, $15,000, helping them list the goals, usually helping them take away half the goals because they are much more certain that they can do more than they could possibly do, and attaching metrics to some of them. And then we've evaluated that on an ongoing basis. We are the kind of evaluators that say we really, really want the truth. We have grants officers in our New York office. We have in-country consultants. We want you to really tell us when you're being successful and when you're not, because we are not going to take away your money at the first opportunity. We're interested in if something isn't working, why is it not working? That was the structure for evaluation that we used for the first 10 years that I was there. For the last four years, we've invested much more heavily in just exactly what you're asking about, looking for the u most useful kind of independent data, teaching, monitoring, and evaluation, trying to help groups use the data that they collect for us in a feedback loop to figure out what they need to be doing differently to improve the numbers or decrease the numbers. And now we have set up a department of strategic learning, research, and evaluation and they will work both on uh, um, monitoring and evaluating our in-country work. So how successful are we in Washington? What happens with this, with the, the president's budget? How many, how many members of Congress votes do we actually change? To also adding a new overlay of work on our international grant making, particularly where I described like, are we moving the needle on a human rights issue outside of just the work we're doing with a particular organization? In India, in Kenya, five years from now, will it be evident that many more people know what their rights are under these supposedly good laws, I mean, good laws on the books against gender-based violence, and how will they do that? Thank you. I personally know of many small organizations in India that work to you know, improve the status of women, of um, impoverished people. Um, how do you go and partner with an organization because I know of so many and they're all doing small things in small parts of the country. Right. It's a huge country. So it's, it's a perfect question because our notion is both to find those small groups, pick the best, but then grow them into a larger movement because as you said, you can have some great small groups scattered around. Sometimes their problem is just a lack of consistency of resources. So they have a great plan, but um, as you all know, if you spend all your life looking for money, um, you don't have much time to do your program. So first of all, how we find the organizations is we are getting better and better known in the countries where we work as the go-to place for grassroots groups that have a vision of change. Second of all, I described us as a human rights organization. Our staff, our in-country consultants who help us find and monitor projects and our program officers take this notion of human rights very seriously, but I just want to be clear to you, it doesn't mean that some little grassroots group that like, wants to bring girls together has to say, we have a right to education and we and the Universal Declaration. It's the way in which people talk about it. It's like we're doing a lot. We are actually the eighth largest funder of LGBTI work, period, in the world, which is wonderful for us and really embarrassing for the world. Um, um, but it's how do those people talk about their human rights? They have made, in some cases, unbelievably brave decisions to come out of the closet, to find each other, to be challenging laws that, that are pretty serious. And they basically, when you listen to them, they say, look, we just did this secretly as long as we could, but we have a right to. So it's the use of that language, it's that sensitivity. 
And the reason for that is because those groups are more sustainable. If, you, if you're sort of a, and I don't want to criticize this, but if you're sort of an organization that does work when somebody funds you, that's less reliable for social, long-term social change in the world than if you just say, we have a right to this. And when Lema Bowie, the woman I referenced from Liberia, I mean, her success was in organizing women to um, end the war, end the civil war in Liberia, um, and demand the peace process, which she did by, among other things, the women went on sex strikes. So if you think that only happens in ancient Greece, you need to brush up on your recent Liberian history. Um, but when she did that, and frankly, at the end of that time, she was like a hero, and she had five children. And people said, okay, you've just like done wonders for our country. Go back and take care of your children. And she was like outraged. She was like, what are you talking about? Like, I just proved that you can bring together Muslim women and Christian women. You can, you can make women stand up to and control the idiotic behavior of men. That's the way she talks about it. So you let me do it. And I want to go and teach the girls in this country and in neighboring countries how to assert their rights. And we were the only people who would fund her. Everybody else was like, you did a great job, go home. And what my staff said was like, this is a woman who's going to set the world on fire. And we need to support her efforts. So I think there's that. Um, and then I think the benefit for us now of focusing and deepening our work in, in these 19 countries will be precisely, and let's take India as an example, to bring these different groups together. And one of the things that happens when you bring together groups that are working on the same issue, especially in a country as large as India, they don't know each other. And so they had no idea that someone is working on something similar in the next town. And they have no idea that somebody thinks the, the first thing to do with girls is to educate them about their human rights. And somebody else thinks that the first thing to do with girls is to educate them about their bodies. And these groups, we bring them together, and they are so empowered because they are the experts. It's not like we brought together 10 groups in Kenya to, to hear from a Western expert about the rights of girls. It's like this group is talking about what they do, and this group is talking about what they're like, you want us to put on an hour-long program talking about what we do? And so, it's, it's, and so that's the effort. And then the next effort is, including with probably lots of the groups you're familiar with, is to play ball with some of the other international funders and say, what can we do? within the structure of what these women want anyway, or these people want anyway, what can we do to help build larger movements? Yes. So my question was around, you know, there's a lot of support. How do you address the cultural problems, though? Because, you know, I might know my rights, but um, um, it's not easy. Like, um, to give an example, I know growing up, I'm from a very I guess relatively modern family, but I was always told good girls get mad before the age of 20, and I did. And after, after you know, a broken engagement and because of dowry demands, and I'm and I'm not, you know, not, not one of the girls you see there. But uh, I know my friends who've been divorced have had problems getting admission to their girls in school. So it's not that they don't know the rights; they know that their girls have a right to education. But because this is a divorced mother, has enough financial support, doesn't get admission for her child in school, where do, where do they go? Because they're aware of their rights. OK, so that's like a, a brilliant question, and I was hoping some of you had some experience with this. So I want to say this is the area where we tread the most carefully. There's n proven no value in Westerners coming in and saying, you have a right to this, you can do that, just sign up here, and then here's your future. And it turns out to be a bad future because you dared to exercise your rights. But what we find is that people are doing this on their own. So they're stepping forward. So take the example you said. Yes, I, th I think that's a perfect example. Some women are exercising their rights because they know their rights. And then they're getting out of bad marriages or excess dowry demands or abusive situations. And then they have no place to turn. And what we find, though, is that they're coming together with each other. They're saying, this is a policy that has to be changed. And I want to be really honest. I, I see that, particularly from the point of view of the people in this room and in our organization, change in these areas comes slowly. But all I know is it doesn't come at all if Westerners come in and say, oh, you should just do this or you should do that. So I'll tell you our most exciting story. It's not, it's not yet in India on this issue, although this is an issue we hope to tackle there very soon in a big way. But we funded, starting 15 years ago, an organization in, northern, in uh, Senegal that was organizing, at that point, they were organizing literacy programs for women. And then they were organizing, by their own request, a program for women to learn about health care. 
But in 1998, that turned into one of the women in one of those healthcare groups saying, if healthcare is a human right, then why do we practice female genital cutting, which is, has hurt many of us, has destroyed the health of our daughters, and has killed some of our children. And they organized from the ground up. And it's, I can't give you a, a story like this every day, but um, there are now 2,200 villages in Senegal that have banned female genital cutting. There's a law on the books. They're training people in other countries. Um, they've gotten several imams to support them, which is critical to the kind of longer-term cultural change you're talking about. Imams who now say it is not true that this is a requirement in the Quran, which is what all of these women believed. So I wish it was faster than that, and I think your example is perfect. Women who exercise their rights then run into, you know, new stumbling blocks. But we have, in a sense for me, there's a benefit to sort of following the lead of the people on the ground. So we're not telling them, if you do this, all will be fine. We're picking up with them where they say, you know, several women here actually chose to exercise their rights under the law, and now they can't get their children into school. So that's the next step. And so how do, we, how do you help us, how do you help us organize to come and make that change? And it's complicated for sure, so you described it eloquently. But it's, it's, they set the next threshold and the next challenge and the next horizon. When I was at, I'll just tell you a personal story that I love. When, we, when the last time I was at Iwaz and Iswan, the, the Muslim group that I talked to you about, they brought in about 20 young girls who were in there. They were learning, they were literally, it was a class, they were learning to write poetry about their lives, but they were also being educated about their rights, and they were fascinated to have all these Westerners there. So they asked some questions about, is there domestic violence in the West? And then they asked, there were two or three men in our group, and so they said, you know, we've never had a man come to hear about what we're doing. And then finally, this one young woman puts up her hand, and she says, I hear that in the United States, it's possible for people of the same sex to love each other. I mean, it was like probably the gutsiest question asked in, in Mumbai in the last decade. Um, and so um, the person who was t um, talking from our group said, um, yes, that is true. And I suddenly realized that I had a picture, a photograph in my wallet of my daughter and my daughter-in-law who are not the same race with their daughter. And so I said to the young woman, here, you might want to look at this. This is a married couple. And these women passed this photograph around. It was like in tatters by the end of an hour. <laughs> so it's like that kind of story. It's like, it's like very slow efforts at, at cultural change. You know, and that will not make gay marriage legal in, uh, in the United States, much, yet, much less in Mumbai tomorrow. But it's a progress. So I think it's building a little bit on what you asked. I think, I mean, even if women know their rights, I think it's hard for them to stand up to their brothers and their right. fathers and all of this. How much do you guys, or how have you guys thought about educating not just the women, but oh, the absolutely. parents and the siblings and like other people that are willing to help? The answer is absolutely. And that's the kind of question that we'll ask a group that we're about to fund. Okay, so it sounds like you really have a determined plan to sort of bring in girls and do this and do that. But we'll say, it's sort of like the example I gave you, we might say, you know, we know of another group where they're trying to ex share this education with men or with parents. And it's a question of when they're ready to take it on. So I just, I, I want to be, we were meeting yesterday, we were meeting yesterday with a, no, that was the night before, sorry, with a woman, a donor. And the exciting thing was American donor, but she, her background is in cultural anthropology. So she, you know, she hasn't been in school in, with all due respect, 30 years, but she was, she got it. It was like, and so it's, it's, very, it's very touch and go, but those issues, that fits with what I'm talking about with larger evaluation, those big changes are gonna be made. There's a whole lot of men who have to be involved. There's a whole lot of parents who have to be involved. And sometimes it's looking for that person who will stand up and say, I actually did this. So the story that I told at the beginning of Zinat, I mean, it, Shaheen went and educated her parents and said like, could you, you know, sort of nicely, could you, but it's not me doing it. It's the organization that I fund calling on that father and saying your daughter's 17 and she's been in three abusive relationships. So that, that can't be what you wish for your daughter. And of course, sometimes you run into a brick wall. Sorry, that's what I have to do. But sometimes you find the people who are ready to make social change. How do you handle, like, I'm from India and I know corruption is so deep-seated that, I mean, it's, we see it every day when you grow up there. How do you handle corruption, A, when you invest with these groups, 
But also when you, even if you educate women, right, in the Delhi rape case, the police were standing by and doing nothing. Like it's not just family support you need the government or the law enforcers or um, even knowing your rights is not enough if there's nobody to enforce that you get it. So can no. you speak to how you deal right. with So that? the first half is easy. Um, seriously, the first half of your question, by and large, for the amounts that we invest and the care with which we determine the, event, the amount and the fact that we're supporting grassroots groups and we're not going through governments, we run into almost none of the corruption that you are correct exists. And that's significant because I have a grants budget, I'm happy to say, of $15 million. The United States probably has a grants budget of $15 million an hour. Um, but most of their budget goes right, in, including in places where they really want to make a difference, starts at the top with the government and ministries and whatever, and it doesn't get ever to the people that we're funding directly. So um, I find that really because of the incredible grassroots and bottom-up work that we're doing, we have only literally in a handful of cases in the last 14 years that I've been there run into corruption by heads of organizations and in most of those cases, I actually wouldn't describe it as corruption. I would describe it as getting too much Western money with too many strings attached and making it too hard for them to figure out how to do it. So they were running their own, not with our money, which is usually general operating support, but then another group would find them and fund them to run a program. And then a third group would find them and fund them. And they just didn't understand what I have to learn every day, which is the mechanisms of being responsive to donors and not, OK. So that part is easy. The other part is like this gigantic challenge. And it's, it's not so different from the questions that you were asking. It's like those changes are, those changes are only going to come, and it's hard to sort of say this, but when one of those empowered women decides to, to become the local panchayat or challenge the local panchayat. My favorite story was a town in which, um, for some reason, the Indian government decided, this is like 10 years ago, to bring television to some of these rural communities. And so there was like the notion of like find a community, of, like a center in town and put the TV there so people can watch it. And a group of women that we were already funding to do microfinance discovered that the panchayat had taken, this is the local government officer, for those of you who aren't Indian, um, who had taken the, um, the television and put it in his own house. So they, they organized and one morning at 7 a.m. he opened the door and there were 40 women sitting in front of his house. And he said, what are you doing here? And they said, we're staying here until you move the television. <laughs> so it's like, when is that going to happen? And it's, it's, I want to say, I mean, I'm so res respectful of the work you do here and the, and the universes that you've built. You know, I wish it was as easy. Um, as, but, it, but that's the way the change occurs. So, you know, I do have a, a donor who's a donor of ours who's also on his own, we just manage the money for him, but investing heavily in trying to change corruption in, in the police departments in rural Kenya, not in India. And I'm working with him all the time, and I, I like that he's doing it, and I'm happy to move that money for him because it makes my bank account larger. But, but I think he and I would be the first to agree. Once you get to that level, it's really difficult. Are you sure you have a good person? And if you are, and by the way, this is an issue that I have too, you might have a good police chief, and I might have a great head of an NGO, but then much is dependent on them and their strength and their staying in place and they're not becoming corrupted. So I think you gave great examples. And um, all I will say is I've particularly learned from working with these sex workers. They are fierce. <laughs> and they are, so I'll tell you a story. Um, we had a volunteer who went with us to Uganda and worked for a labor rights organization in Uganda. And he got to know a group which was an organization of sex workers. So we were funding them mostly to make sure that they had good health care. But they described to us, and then they described to this young man who was a lawyer by training, that um, their problem was the police. That the police would show up and say, you know, we know that you're um, selling sex for money and we're not paying. We just want the sex and they were both demanding it for no money and they were abusing them and it was, they were being violent. So it was exactly what the women didn't want. So they, the, this young lawyer talked to them and he said, okay, look, this is like a long shot. I don't think this will work, but you'll never bring a criminal case successfully against any of those people. But because of um, Ugandan law, we might be able to bring a civil case. So what I need you to do is when a police officer shows up, I'll need you and does that. I can't stop him from doing it. But if you can get his name and his badge number 
and just collect these over the next few months, then we'll bring a civil case. So they said, OK. And then he didn't hear from them at all. So he thought it hadn't worked. So after like two and a half months, he called them and he said, like, I thought we were going to collaborate in this civil suit. And they said, oh, our problems are over. And he said, what do you mean your problems are over? And they said, when the police show up, we say, you know, we have a camera. You don't know where it is. They said, we don't have a camera. But we tell them, we have a camera. <laughs> and we're writing down your names and your badge numbers. And we have a lawyer who's going to sue you all and name you in the local newspaper. And they went away. <laughs> So this guy feels like he's solved the problems of corruption in Uganda. <laughs> but I mean, it's, that's the kind of initiative. And I just, I mean, I'm, I'm very fortunate to have this job, but I keep hearing it come up from the bottom. And look, it's terrible. I mean, I could tell you horrendous problems. I was most, one of the countries I was in in the past year was Cambodia. And in Cambodia, they pay teachers so little that first of all, they don't come to work. So the school structure isn't what it looks like. And second of all, they demand sexual favors from their students. Now, like, I'm not going to be able to stop that tomorrow. So, but it's like building a group that just sort of simply stands up someplace and says, enough, we're not taking this anymore. And we do know that those people have been successful in history, including for sure in India. So, Thank you. Does, does anyone who's on the GVC have a question? Can I ask a question? Yeah, please. Hi, it's very nice to meet you, Ruth. I get a lot of um, emails from American Jewish World Service, and I have two friends that are actually in India working with the um, AJWS right now. Wonderful. I'm actually leaving for India tonight. So, All right. Um, for this trip. I'm very excited, and one thing that I struggle with a little bit is that, especially working at Google, um, where we're very focused on connecting people around the world and bringing Google services to people around the world because it un unlocks knowledge, which turns into power and finding information. I sometimes feel that there's a concept of, well, they are these people in these remote countries are so far away from me. What could I ever do? I live in the United States, and I know I'm lucky to have all these things, but there's not much I can do personally. Um, as I'm going on this trip, or for anyone else that has an upcoming trip uh, to a, one of these countries you're talking about, what can you recommend upon returning um, actions that we can take and eat in just our daily lives? OK, don't tell people how much I paid you to ask this question <laughs> at this particular <laughs> point in time. Um, so I think there's several things that are really important. One is really pay attention, you yourself, I don't know you, but to like what you're seeing and how it impacts you. Um, because bringing back, for those people who didn't grow up in another country or haven't traveled, bringing back the descriptions you have to be careful, because some of it threatens just to overwhelm people. Yeah. And then they think, there's nothing I can do. But on the other hand, people haven't seen the dimensions of poverty, oppression, hunger that you, will, that you may see some of, that you'll learn from your friends who are over there. So part of it is just sort of being, coming back as a reporter as to what you've seen. But ideally, we're talking about coming back as a reporter of not only what you saw in the problems, but what you see as these change agent organizations. I mean, we run study tours every year. And part of the reason for that is that I've learned that I could talk a lot, and I do, um, mm -hmm. and tell stories, which I try to do. But it's seeing it really changes people's understanding of the fact that solutions come from the grassroots, of the fact that for re relatively little money that we're giving to these organizations makes dramatic change. But then when you come back, it's, and I'll push a little bit, it's to take on three roles. One is educating your friends. And since you're at Google, you all have this amazing network. So it's literally do a blog. If it's a great blog, we'll publish it. But do a blog, sort of say, here's what I saw, here's what I learned, and here are the kinds of groups that I understand that are making a difference. So it's, it's community education. Two is, of course, I will mention donations. And I just want to say carefully, and this came up in an early question, but pay attention. You know, there are groups that are doing just spectacular advertising to get you to give them money, and they have terrible scores from the rating agencies. The rating agencies are far from perfect. They know that they're far from perfect. They know that they don't measure enough about impact, just what your question was. But they're rating for at least decent financial management. And I have people all the time who say, oh, well, if I were going to give to you, I'd have to stop giving to my favorite charity, which is X. And I can sometimes say, have you ever looked up that charity? They're like spending all their money writing you for more money. Um, and and th those are all rated. So it's like, think about giving and giving thoughtfully. And please don't think, which you alluded to correctly, 
don't think like um, I'm, um, uh, you know, it's just my money. I can't do enough. I can't make a difference. Don't think this is so overwhelming. I mean, if I would say to anything to all of us as Americans, as Google employees, it's we don't have the luxury of retreating to being overwhelmed. We actually each have the capacity to make a difference. Small amounts of money make a big difference. And the third thing that you can do is get involved, hopefully with us, but really with anybody, on, on advocacy. The United States spends our tax dollars doing international development work rather poorly. Um, they spend those mo that money for geopolitical purposes. I'm in favor of that. I would like us to have good standing in the world. I'd like us to have friends. And, but it's not. Whatever they tell you, it's unfortunately not money that's usually going to help poor people. And so that's why, in a sense, you need to look for additional charities and targeted dollars and need to look at their ratings. But it's also why you have to work to change US policy. So we would be happy. Uh, we'll pass around a piece of paper. You can tell Anya, any of you want to be on our website or whatever, um, you know, it, it's not painful. You're all good at communicating. But right now, we need people to be lobbying members of Congress on this budget change. This is huge. And I promise you that a change in where food dollars are going is not going to be on the front pages of the Chronicle or the New York Times in the next month. I don't think. I wish it were. We actually get quoted in these articles. We got quoted in the Manchester Guardian yesterday, which is like a big deal. Um, but, um, but you know, there, there's a lot of talk about tax cuts and cuts to um, entitlement programs, and that's where the debate is going to be. But if the United States can really spend, under the State Department, spend money flexibly to buy food from local farmers, it could make a huge difference in key parts of the world. So it's educate others, think wisely about contributing, um, and it's become an advocate for change. And I will tell you, because it motivates me, a few teachings, um, not surprisingly, right now these happen to be Jewish teachings, but they're pretty applicable to the whole world. Um, so there's a famous social justice-oriented rabbi of the 20th century who said, in a free society where terrible wrongs exist, some are guilty, but all are responsible. And then there's a long ago Jewish teaching that says, you are not required to complete the task, but you can't refuse to participate. So that's, those are thoughts I would leave you with. And thank you for the great opportunity and the question. Um, if you could talk about the disaster relief work that you do, and especially um, how do you find those grassroots organizations in places that you've never worked in before, and to do it quickly so that it actually has It's a perfect happened. question. We actually don't. Um, we will, and increasingly going forward strategically as a, as a lesson we've learned over the last 15 years, we will target our disaster, our, our, our visibility after disaster will be targeted to the extent that it's a country in which we already work. Um, doesn't mean we'll refuse because disasters, because of media and because of sad stories and drama, disasters are one of the few issues that get covered in the American press. And so it's one of the times for us to capture new donors. So God forbid if there was a disaster tomorrow in a country in which we've never worked, we would put ourselves on the Google lists, on the New York Times list. But we would also strategize within 36 hours, because that's about the window that we have, as to, OK, if we get a lot of money for this disaster, exactly what are we going to do? Because it's not a country in which we've done work. And most likely answer is we'd partner with some people, or we'd tell people, you know, if you want to feed people tomorrow, actually don't send the money to us, because it's going to take us two months to figure out. That's on the first hand. On the other hand, countries where we have worked, where we know grassroots groups, I'm just going to say right up front, we are infinitely better placed to do your relief money, because the money will actually get to the people in the need almost immediately, and it won't all be spent at once. Because in Haiti, the story <coughs> is not just what did people need right away? It's like, how do you, Haiti's a country that fed its entire population on its own, off of its own land 50 years ago. And it's now totally dependent on um, expensive imports. And the big danger after something like the earthquake is that it will only make that worse. Or the more food aid we bring in, the, the lower the options for Haitian farmers. And so we're really pretty smart. Our, we received six and a half million dollars after the earthquake and told, we didn't tell every $10 donor, but we told every decent sized donor, this is a five year plan um, for investment in um, 
protecting women and girls and agricultural sustainability in Haiti. And if you want to spend it tomorrow, give it to someone else, but it won't be as useful. We had eight project partner organizations in Haiti at the time of the earthquake, two that we had funded previously. We now have 41 because they lead us to others. Um, Oh, I, I forgot to say, the, first of all, that we advertise our trips on our website, which is ajws.org. And second of all, despite my evident advanced age, I want you all to know that I tweet. So. <laughs>